Good morning. Good morning. Happy Wednesday to everyone. Boy, I'm excited today. Excited. We have a a wealth of information, a trove of information to share with you today. Wow, I've been decoding, decoding so much, so much good, good things are coming as a result. Come on in to our Bible study today. Great. We're we're waiting for you as you come in. Welcome, welcome. Good morning. My God, I am excited. I hope that you're excited as well. Welcome to our Bible study. Again, we want to say uh, congratulations to those of you who are continuing to press on, continuing to press on. We have just a few days left in this year, 15 days. 15. 15 is the number of rest, resting in God, pursuing in God, growing in the faith, seeking God for more information. How do we become powerful believers in Christ? How do we grow in Christ? Well, to everyone who's new to our uh, broadcast today, we welcome you. We welcome you. And uh, this is our daily Bible study. And we're covering the book of Joel, the chapter one, two, and three, Proverbs chapter. No, that's wrong. We're covering Proverbs chapter 16 and Romans chapter one. So please excuse that error there. Let me straighten that error out right now. Let me straighten it out. And we just want to just say welcome 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 to the study welcome every one of you we want to welcome you to the study and we hope that you are blessed we hope that you are enriched as we cover this information and we're using our personal prayer diary our personal prayer diary And this is a guide that we're using as a structured guide, as a structured guide. And we're we're learning not only how to keep track daily of the scripture and cover the Bible in one year's time, but we're learning how to pray for nations, pray for different nations each week. We get to cover 52 nations in a year, praying and, and lifting up those nations. We are memorizing verses. We learn more than 52 verses a year, just reading scripture and a different prayer emphasis, different prayer emphasis. So each day, 365 days as a different prayer emphasis. So I want to just encourage you to use this to build the dynamic of prayer in your life, the dynamic of prayer in your life. So use this. Well, today, today I want to uh, just get right into our study uh, in a moment because we have a lot of material. But our memory verse this week is Isaiah 61 1. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoner. Today is Wednesday and we're lifting up education. Father, we pray for educators. We pray for administrators in education. We thank you, God, for those who are in charge of curriculums. We pray for the education of students. We ask that the kids will be blessed in their studies and that they will have access to education. We thank you, Father, for the nations of the earth and giving them to access to to academia. We pray for the nation of Vietnam that in that nation, the literacy rate will increase and every man every woman, every boy, girl, every person will have access to an education. So we pray for the peace of God to rule in Vietnam. We ask God that you would bless the nations of Vietnam and that you will deliver them from the plagues, that deliver them. God, we ask that they will be open 
open to hear and to see the wonderful things that you have prepared for those who love you. We ask God that the church will grow and mature in the Vietnam nation and that Vietnam will impact China and Laos and Thailand and Cambodia in Jesus' name. God, we pray the children in Sweden will come to know their creator. We thank you for revival in Sweden, that you're impacting Sweden. Sweden is an awesome nation. We've had the opportunity to plant a church in Sweden. And this, this community in Sweden, in Elmholtz, it's a powerful community. God has given them favor. And they have a television station that broadcasts uh, throughout the nations. And so we uh, are lifting up that those children will be impacted by children programming coming through Channel 10 Sweden. God, we pray that you would deliver us from COVID. We pray for the recovery of those who have been impacted. We thank you for the first responders, essential workers, doctors and nurses. Thank you for the vac the vaccinations that are taking place. We thank you, Father, for those that you are continued to provide for who's lost jobs or who've been furloughed. We thank you, Father, for the wisdom of our leaders of nations teaching us and helping us to navigate successfully through these very turbulent times. Father, we thank you for the nations of the earth and we bless the churches in every nation and every continent in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, uh, God, in the islands, we thank you. Antarctica, Father, we thank you for what you are doing and what you are accomplishing now. In your son's name, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, today we start a new book. There's a lot of information that we're going to cover today. And so I'm going to encourage you uh, just to go back over it, to, to review it, because Joel, the book of Joel is loaded with fresh revelation to inspire you and to encourage you today. And keep in mind, this is an Old Testament, New Testament survey. It's actually a devotional guide. The prayer diary is to help to enhance your devotional time uh, between you and the Lord, your prayer and your study of the scripture. So we're surveying the scriptures. We're there's so much here, we can't cover it all in one hour and 15 minute time. I hope I get it accomplished today in that amount of time. But nonetheless, we can't cover it all. So there are certain things that we're highlighting today and it's your responsibility to go back and to test those things what you, what you hear, to test them. So that's why you must become a student of the word. You must study both the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, uh, the New Testament. These books are to be a part of your routine study. And so that's why we have this prayer diary guide to help you to cover the scriptures from January 1 to December 31st. And we have been faithful with this, faithfully studying and looking into the scriptures every day since March, since the month of March. This is our eighth month, our eighth month of studying. And, and I wanna commend those who started off with us and those of you who are just joining, I wanna commend you and exhort you to continue forward. So I've asked that that we, I asked the Lord to give us a theme so that we can tie these books together as a theme, as a thought. And today, this morning, our thought is why every believer should practice fasting. Why you should practice fasting. One of the, one of the most misunderstood practice is fasting and prayer. And many people, they pray, uh, they, they fast, but they're not doing biblical fasts. And it's important that you review what fasting actually is and begin to implement that in your life. A fast is, is to 
is to bring about a breakthrough in your life. Historically, believers have practiced fasting for spiritual breakthrough. Believers, and we read the stories in the scriptures. And if you if you love history, study some of the early church fathers in the, in the first and second and third century, and you see these these devout believers practicing fasting and writing about spiritual warfare, overcoming darkness as a result of fasting and crying out and praying unto our God. Many breakthroughs are recorded, recorded throughout the text. And so we have studied throughout the scriptures times when the people fasted and called upon God. And as a result of fasting and calling upon God, they saw tremendous breakthrough in their lives. And this is why you should fast to get breakthrough. The, re the way you're going to break some of the bondage in your life, some of the strongholds in your life is through the power of fasting. And one of the most powerful expressions of fasting is corporate fasting. It's when two or more gather together to fast, when churches come together to fast. Fasting um, isn't something to be done with ease. You, you don't make fasting easy for you. Fasting is not, not giving up cigarettes or, or television. That's, that's not difficult. Fasting is coming into a place of anguish, hunger, where well, hunger pains makes you want to, um, makes you hurt because you're hungry, headaches, detox in your body. This is what fasting does. Fasting isn't, isn't to be a bit of ease. It's to produce anguish and agony, severe discomfort in one's life. So today, the body, the church of Christ needs a divine breakthrough. We need to fast for the nations. We need to fast for the things that are in front of us. Calamity in nations, wars and, and, and economic uh, collapse and fan and uh, storms. We need to seek the face of God. So as we go into Joel, we're going to learn and study some things about people, about God, how he operates and how he moves. Joel chapter one. Joel chapter one is a lengthy call to Judah to lament because of God's unleashing judgment. The destruction comes through a locust invasion, a drought and a famine and fire. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Peduel, hear this, you elders, and give ear to all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your day or even in the days of your fathers? The elders were not only leaders, but were also the elderly men. So their memory would reach back the farthest, the unusualness of the calamity testifies to its being other than natural desire. I'm mean, excuse me, natural disaster. The lesson that this judgment of God teaches is meant to last for generations. Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation what the chewing locusts left, the swarming locusts have eaten, what the swarming locusts left. The crawling locusts have eaten, and what the crawling locusts left, the consuming locust has eaten. Now, Joel is an interesting prophet because his record, he's writing about the judgment. He is not dealing with the issue of the cause of judgment, and he's pulling his sources from other prophets. Isn't that interesting? In other words, Joel was given to studying the word. He studied the word. This is why you must study the word. We must be committed to studying the scriptures. Chewing locusts, swarming locusts, crawling locusts, consuming locusts. These locusts is a jumping, flying insect, similar to grasshoppers. These four designations may be four stages of a locust development or a poetic form used to indicate the total devastation of the land. 
The best explanation, however, is that this is a description of four separate waves of locusts, each one eating what the other had left until the land is totally stripped of foliage. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vein, my vine, and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Lament, cry. This is a time of weeping and intercession. This is a time of travail in the spirit. Here the locusts are described as warlike nation, too large to number. Its teeth are its weapons that crush and devour everything. Sackcloth is rough, a coarse cloth made into a bag-like garment. It was worn to symbolize deep grief or contrition and repentance before God. It was often used by prophets to symbolize their brokenness in the face of, of message of calamity and judgment. Husband of her youth, the bridegroom was often referred to as the husband of his engaged bride. The loss of a husband brought the deepest and most painful grief. So here, as he's writing, he's encouraging you to to pray, to, to lament. We need to pray and lament about the days in which we're living. We need to pray and lament regarding what is taking place in our cities, what is happening in our nations. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is waste, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The lack of offering reflected the greatest calamity for Israel. For when there was no longer grain or wine for the sacrifices, the covenant relationship with God was suspended. This was a sign that God had rejected his people. Part of the ritual sacrifices was this intimate relationship between God and his people. But now there is famine. There is no grain. There is no wine. There is no sacrifices to give to God. So this was a signal that God had rejected his people. Look at what's happening today. Churches can no longer meet. People are no longer gathering. Some people are trying to force the issues of gathering, but they do not have the strength that they had prior to this pandemic. Grain and wine and oil were the staples of their diet. And here we see people lining up, breaking record amount of numbers, lining up for food because people don't have food. We need to pray. Children are without food. Single mothers cannot provide for their children. We must pray and fast and seek the face of God for breakthrough. The vine, verse 12, has dried up and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourself and lament, you priests. Well, you who minister before the altar, come. Lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. God is dealing with intercessors. Intercessors can't sleep through the night because of the burden to pray. 
the burden to intercede, people requesting prayer and intercession, people needing, needing uh, medical attention, people needing deliverance from torment, people needing jobs. Here in verse 17 are clear references to the drought that follows the locust. See, the locust. Consecrate a fast. Consecrate a fast. Call in a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. To consecrate a fast is to set an assigned time for a national service of prayer in connection with fasting. For this purpose, the priests are called a sacred, are to call a sacred assembly, a meeting of the full congregation of Judah not just the priests. For all intent and purposes for us, we are to personally consecrate a fast, set a time of fasting and prayer. And usually many believers set January as a time of seeking the face of God. And usually that's a good time because you start off your new year, you're praying and fasting for breakthrough that the new year will be a better year for you but it is even more powerful than when the body of Christ collectively come together to fast and to pray, to consecrate, to set a time for a national service of prayer that believers throughout the nations should gather to pray and to fast. The day in this instance is the approaching devastating judgment of God. At last, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the cocks. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down, for the grain has withered. Just think that during this pandemic, the farmers were throwing away milk by the millions of gallons, food being discarded because the systems had broken down. But thank God for young people who, who rally together to set systems of distribution to send into our cities to help people who don't have access to food to get food. We must pray, saints. We must pray and fast and seek the face of God. Verse 18, how the animals groan. The herd of all cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. Oh Lord, to you I cry out for fire has devoured the open pastures and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you for the water brooks are dried up and fire has devoured the open pastures. It is uncommon for fires to break out on a land left desolate by locusts or drop. Fire is a well understood figurative use of God and also of judgment. It is therefore an apt figure tying together the natural calamity and the judgment of God. So the judgment of God comes as fire, figuratively speaking. Chapter two, verse one, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. Trumpet, the ram's horn known as the shofar, was used both to herald impeding danger as here and called the assembly together as in verse 15. Zion is the top of the temple mountain where the Lord was enthroned in the sanctuary. At the summit of Mount Moriah, Psalm 2, verse 6, day of the Lord, a season of judgment and divine justice upon all nations around Israel. Have you noticed 
every nation is impacted by this pandemic. A day of darkness and gloominess, verse two, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Like the morning clouds, mountains can be red like morning dawn. It spreads over the mountains. This refers to the bright reflection of the sun on the wings of the swarming locusts. Bright glimmers of light dancing off the wings of the mirrors of locusts literally turn the sky to a yellow fog-like texture. The phenomenon is observed a day or more before the creature actually arrives. For several days, the swarm are so thick and continuous that they turn the sky black as night. That people is, is figurative language is seen in verses uh, five through eight. A fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape. Interesting that we see again the reference to the Garden of Eden within scripture is to remind us of the beauty of the garden, a fire devourer. This reference to the judgment of God may also describe a literal fire, which often accompanies terrible locust swarms. Garden of Eden is a reference to the garden paradise of unfallen man, like the appearance of horses. Verse four, their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds, so they run. The head of the locust looks very much like that of horses. The German word for locust means literally, hey, horse. Verse five, with a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people wreath in pain. All faces are drained of color. Noise like chariots, noise of flaming fire. Eyewitnesses declare that the locusts, when running and flying, have a clicking, rattling sound. When they eat, they can sound like a stubble field on fire. This is why we must pray and fast. We must pray and ask God to have mercy upon us, pity us, and don't let the severity of judgment come in our time. We must pray for our loved ones that they will be converted. Sinners will be converted unto the Lord that they will churn from their wicked ways, that God will extend our time without this severity of judgment. Ch chapter two, verse seven. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Is it an interesting? We should learn from this. We should learn. They don't break rank. They're not busy backbiting or signifying or speaking evil of one another. They are not breaking rank. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they loathe, loathe between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter it at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. There are many accounts of the unalterable and unstoppable columns of locusts. There is no road impassable to locusts. They penetrate into fields, crops, uh, trees, cities, houses, and even the recesses of the bed chambers. Jerome the historian records. The earth quakes before them, the heaven trembles, the sun and the moon grow dark, 
and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now, therefore, say the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, fasting, weeping, and with mourning. This time of calamity is not a time to have fun at home. It's not a time to be thankful that you don't have to go to work. It should be a time of fasting and prayer, seeking the face of God, asking God to move powerfully upon our nation, upon our families, upon our cities, upon our communities, his army. Here the figures again merge to that future day when the Lord himself shall lead his armies against the nation and accomplish his judgment. A day when even the natural universe recoils. Who can endure it is a rhetorical question, underlining the fact that no one will be able to stand before the Lord's day. Verse 13. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness and he relents from doing harm. Did you notice that? Rend your heart. Man, we know how to, we know how to put on religious, a religious show. We know how to look like we're holy, dress like we're church folk. But God is saying it's not about your outward appearance. It's about your internal configuration. Rend your heart, pray, lament, fast, seek my face. When we are dealing with God, we are never without hope, even in the midst of extreme circumstances, which as in this case, are his judgments. We can turn our hearts to him and find help and salvation. He is never vindictive or cruel. Rather, he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Verse 14, who knows if he will turn and relent? and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly. Did you see Joel? He's out, he's, he's out exhorting Judah to consecrate a fast, to call a sacred assembly, to blow a trumpet in Zion. Rend your heart and not your garment. The tearing of one's garment was common practice in times of grief or contrition. It symbolized the broken and torn spirit. Here, Joel is calling for Judah to actually experience what this symbolism portrays. Hearts that are torn with grief and the confession of their sins. When is the last time you wept for someone? When is the last time you wept for yourself? When is the last time you've prayed before God, prostrate before God, on your knees before God, weeping and asking for breakthrough in your life, asking for siblings to have received breakthrough, asking for children to receive breakthrough? Blow the trumpet. The first trumpet was the sound of the alarm of impeding and danger. Here, the second trumpet is to call the nation to repentance and contrition before God. In this season, we cannot, we cannot be timid in our expression of our faith. In this season, we must be bold in sharing our faith. We must ask God for the skill to share your faith. We are to cry loud and spare not. Lift up our voice like a trumpet. Isaiah chapter 58. Joel. Chapter two, verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, pastors, gather them, sanctify them, sound the alarm. It's time to fast and seek God, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. This is not a time to marry. This is a time to seek the face of God. 
as the sin and judgment has touched every person from the elders to the nursing babes. So repentance was to include every person. It was to interrupt the bride and bridegroom. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep before the porch and the altar, pastors, leaders, apostles, prophets. When, when was the last time you wept for your congregation? You wept for your house. You wept for yourself. You wept for your community. When was the last time you wept for your nation, for the leaders? Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep before the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. That the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Between the porch and the altar. Between the porch of the temple and the altar of burning offering. This would place them directly in front of the door of the holy place. Where the presence of God is enthroned. Here, the priests, as mediators for the nation, would intercede with tears. Your heritage, the nation of Judah, was considered to be God's own possession. For him to reject them would mean to reject his own heritage. Children are the heritage of the, of the, of the Lord. See, God's own heritage. If Judah was destroyed, it would bring reproach on God himself. Moses taught us this. God, what would they say if you destroyed them? What would they say about you, God? You delivered them from cocaine. You delivered them from heroin. You delivered them from harlotry, from whoredom. What would they say? God delivered me. God delivered me. That's why I pray and fast and seek the face of God, asking God to keep me. I cannot keep myself. It's only by the grace of God. It's only by the word of God that I can't. Verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his, for his land and pity his people. Then the Lord, did you notice that? Then the Lord will. Why? Then the Lord, look, look. Then the Lord, why? Go back to the previous verse. When the priests cry and weep. When we weep and cry, then God moves. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. When you fast and pray, God will be zealous for you. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. You will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach to the nation. Listen, we are not driven by conspiracies. We're not driven by hoax, ho ho a hoax. We're not uh, uh, driven by uh, a gossip. We're driven by the word of the Lord. COVID-19 cannot touch us, according to Psalm 91. But we must use wisdom. You cannot be foolish out there just aimlessly wandering around without protection. It's like the Jews not putting the blood on the door, doorpost. When the death angel came into Egypt, everyone who refused to put the blood died. So we must pray and intercede for the wisdom of God to come upon our lives, that God will bless and protect us and cause us to prosper. I pray for every business person right now. I pray that your businesses will not falter your businesses will be blessed of the Lord. You will, you will excel. Your businesses will come bigger because God is now sobering you. The, this promise of relief and blessing without a specific time reference prophesies in an era, prophecies an era in which both physical and spiritual needs will be met. Yes, deliverance and breakthrough will be met. Wow, isn't that good? Verse 19, the Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. You will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nation, but I will remove far from you the Northern army. 
and will drive him away in, into a barren and desolate land with his face towards the Eastern Sea and his back towards the Western Sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. We'll be zealous. In Hebrew language, this can also be understood to be a present rather than a future reality. Typical to poetic prophecy is the merging of time. The prayer offered in verse 17 is seen as answered and the restoration of the land as begun. The Northern army, this should be taken to mean the army of locusts, perhaps blowing in from the North. The Eastern sea is the Dead Sea. The Western sea is the Mediterranean Sea. One way these swarms are stopped is by a wind that drives the locusts into large bodies of water, stench, foul odor. The dead locusts are washed ashore by the waves. Their petrifying remains fill the air with a terrible stench. God can use armies like Babylon and Assyria or Medo Persia, but he can also use nation, he can use nature, he can use locusts as we see here as Joel is prophesied. Verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. God is, is declaring today prophetically that restoration, that which has been eaten by the locusts, the caterpillar, that which has been eaten by the swarming locusts, that which has been taken from you, God is going to restore. 2021 will be a year of grace and restoration. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, the chewy locusts, my great army, which I sit among you. Children of Zion represent all the people of Judah, not just those living in Zion, Former rain refers to the autumn rains, which came at planting time. Latter rain is the spring rain that occurs just before harvest. This outpouring of refreshing rain, which renews the fertility of the parched ground, prefigures the outpouring of the spring, which will bring spiritual renewal. For those of us who live in America, the seasons are switched, but here it's describing the time in the Middle East, in Jerusalem. And this is their seasons of planting and seasons of harvesting. 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Do you see God wants to show himself mighty in your behalf? He wants to show himself strong in your behalf. Pray fast. Ask God to recalibrate you. Ask God to examine your faith and to upgrade your faith. Be like Peter. God, increase my faith. Be, be, be like those examples that we read about in the scriptures and begin to adjust your life, begin to build in your life. Learn how to pray as they pray. Learn to do what they did. 
never be put to shame. Repeat it in verse 27. This is direct is a direct answer to the priest's prayer in verse 17. Do not give your heritage to reproach. God, do not give us to reproach. Do not give us to shame. For three reasons, they will not be ashamed. One, God has dealt wondrously with you. Two, I am in the midst of Israel. Three, I am the Lord, your God. Come to pass afterwards. This is the bridge to the final section, the application of the plague of locusts to the final judgment of God on the nation at the end of this age. Wow. Verse 27, then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other God. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision. So we see, we see the fulfillment. And also on my maid servants and my men, uh, men servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillar of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon the Lord. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the remnant of whom the Lord calls. Listen, church, this includes us. It includes us, God moving powerfully. Chapter three, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, in those days points back to chapters two, verse 28. It begins a more complete explanation of exactly how the judgment of the Lord on the nations will be carried out. Captives, contextually, are those of Judah and Israel who have been dispersed throughout the nations of the earth. It answers to verse 2, whom they have scattered among the nations. In a broader sense, some scholars interpret it as applying to disperse the Jews returning to a restored end time Israel. Others see it as symbolically referring to the church. I will also gather, verse two, all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. The Valley of Jehoshaphat, in Jewish traditions, this is thought to be part of the Kindron Valley between the temple and the Mount of Olives. Jehoshaphat means Yahweh is judged. This, therefore, may be a symbolic place of judgment and decision rather than an actual place in Joel's mind. Verse three. They have cast lots for my people, have given a, a boy as payment for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon and all of the coast of Felicia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my prized possession. Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks that you may remove them far from their borders. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sibians, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Cast lots for my people. When a nation was conquered, it was a common practice to distribute the slaves by drawing lots. 
boy as payment for a harlot, girl for wine. The terrible conditions of actually using boys and girls as currency to pay for a night with a prostitute or get a glass of wine. This is how debased the people had become. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare the war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Beat your plowshares, pruning hooks. This is an inversion of Isaiah two and four. There, the weapons of war are to be made into instruments of peace. Here, the implements of peaceful agriculture are to be made into weapons of war. The language is symbolic. Verses 11, assemble and come all you nations and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Your mighty ones are the heroes of God or the heavenly armies which carry out his bidding. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through her again. And it will come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. For fountains shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Archaeus. Multitudes. The word can also be translated tumult and refer to the noisy multitudes flowing into the valley of decision, the place of God's final ver verdict. Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall abide forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation for I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I had not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in Zion. I will, whom I had not acquitted. Some make this pardoning of the nations who have not been judged by God and therefore can be pardoned. Others see this as a statement indicating that all guilt can now be forgiven since the Lord dwells in Zion. Joel now uses this dwelling in Zion to mean that the Lord has established his kingdom and all the enemies of his people have been eliminated. This is the beginning of the world to come. What powerful, tremendous insight. So I encourage you to go back and review and soak in the revelation, soak in the insight. Proverbs chapter 16. The Lord weighs the spirits. The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. We can make our own plans, but God has the last words. Commit, verse three, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. The Lord has made all for himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. Everyone proud in his heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. Mercy and truth makes atonement for sin. When a man, verse seven, 
ways please the Lord. He makes even his enemy to be at peace with him. When people live lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace. Um, verse seven, verse eight, excuse me, verse eight. Better is a little with righteousness than vast revenues without justice. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Divination is on the lips of the king. His mouth must not transgress in judgment. On his weights and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his works. The Lord demands accurate scales and balances. He sets the standard for fairness and equity. It is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him who speaks what is right. As messengers of death is the king's wrath, but a wise man will appease it. Good leaders abhor wrongdoing of any kind. Sound leadership has a moral foundation to it. Wisdom and understanding is more valuable than gold and silver. In the light, verse 15, in the light of the king's face is life and his favor is like a cloud of latter rain. How much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who keeps his way preserves his soul. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better is to be of an humble spirit with the, with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. The wise in heart will be called prudent, and sweetness of the lips increases learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life to him who has it, but the correction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The person who labors, labors for himself, for his hungry mouth drives him on. The ungodly man digs up evil, and it is on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. He winks his eye to devise perverse things. He pursues his lips and brings about evil. The mouth is to be trained. The silver-haired head, head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way of righteousness. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's ever de every decision is from the Lord. Better to, it's better to be patient than powerful, better to have self-control than conquer a city. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. Romans chapter one. Wow, Romans, Romans. Great book, great book, great book bond servant of Jesus Christ. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. The word bond servant is the word doulos, means servant, devoted slave, one who serves Christ. Called to be separated to the gospel, the good news, the writings, the word of God. We are called to be separated to the gospel. We are called to be separated to the good news, to the word of God. Verse two, which he promised before through, through his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son, Jesus, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship 
for obedience to faith among the nations for his name. So right in here, because we have studied the word line upon line, precept upon precept, we can understand it uh, fuller. We can have a much enhanced understanding of this text in holiness because we know the lifestyle of the people. We know what took place among Israel and Judah and how God, God provided the measures to reconcile them and now it's fulfilled through the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord, born of the seed of David, the fulfillment of the scripture, that David's seed shall continually rule the throne, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, the spirit of holiness, living holy, Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace, and without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So here, the spirit of holiness, and he comes and he performs signs and wonders and miracles that the Lord God is confirming the word with signs and wonders. Through him, we receive grace and apostleship. So Paul is letting us know it's through him that we receive this, verse six, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, that no longer, no longer the believers Faith, uh, uh, faith, a reproach. Not people are hearing of their faith throughout the world. So our faith should be a testimony. As we as we transact our businesses with others, your faith, who you are in Christ, should be a testimony. You must become an excellent representation of Christ. Verse nine. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayer. Apostle Paul is our prayer model. Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in prayer. Making, verse 10, making request if by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So we should be constantly praying and praying without ceasing is continually keeping people upon your, your, your heart, training your spirit man to intercede constantly for people. Verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. Apostle Paul, our leadership model. I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. I long for this time. I wake up early anticipating this, this time of the day to minister to you, to encourage you in hope that you will grow and be established in Christ, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Verse 12. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you, just as among the other Gentiles, that my labor and my service to you is in hope of seeing fruit with you that seeing your faith get charged, seeing you walking in faith, seeing you practicing practicing your faith, seeing you being obedient to the word of God through your giving, through your sacrifice, sacrificial giving, through praying for others, laying hands on the sick and believing the word of God that if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Verse 14, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians both to wise and to unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Apostle Paul is our model for ministry. He was called to learn, to, to the learn and unlearn, ready to preach the gospel, 
was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Verse 15, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. So our faith and hope in Christ, our faith in this book, our hope in this book is the power of God to us, the power of God to salvation. Verse 17, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And we just studied this in Joel. We saw it in Ezekiel. We saw it in Jeremiah and Isaiah. We saw it throughout the book how God responds to ungodliness. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, all ungodliness and unrighteousness is exposed. Everything that's done behind doors shall be shown in the light. Everything uh, hidden shall be shouted from the rooftop. Evil people suppress truth. The gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The Jew first, also for the Greek. It is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, the process of corruption. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Isn't it what we just read? We just read this. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Here it is. Remember their idols are the works of men's hands. And so birds and four-footed animals and creeping things Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So now they're worshiping doctrines of devils, serving idols, and now they're per performing holotry. They're full of lust, lustful passions. Verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. They knew God, but did not glorify him as God. Verse 28, and even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backsliders, hater of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgments of God, 
that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. The fruit of one's life or li life are the result of what was practiced. What you see your life in right now is what you practiced yesterday. Do you see this? Do you see this? 10 insights of turning away from God. They knew God, but stopped glorifying him as God. They are unthankful and become futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts are darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who bless it forever. God gave them up to vile passions. Their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, men leaving the natural use of a woman, burning their lust for one another. Same sex, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. The works of the flesh, they do not like to return, retain God in their knowledge. They don't want to. God gives them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. This is why we must keep this word before us, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexually, sexually, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, and maliciousness, the carnal mind full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. 18 things, and the number 18 symbolizes bondage. What a word. So this is why. Every believer should practice fasting for spiritual breakthrough. What a word. Great job. Great job. Great job staying with us as we continue to push through this word, as we continue to, to, to build, to build you in the spirit. Again, we're using the prayer diary. We invite you to go to anthonyearl.org. And there, click the resource tab at the top of the web page, and you will find more detailed information regarding this diary and how it can benefit you. We want to encourage you, if you have not already gotten a, a copy of your 2021 prayer diary, I exhort you to go to anthonyero.org, click the resource tab, and so so into this ministry, and we will uh, send to you a copy of this personal prayer diary as our love gift to say thank you. Well, don't forget, continue to continue to share. If this word was a blessing to you, share it with others. Share it with others that they may too, that they too may be blessed by the word of the Lord. We thank you for your prayers, your continual prayers, your continual, continual intercession. Thank you for your seed song. And thank you for continuing to be a support to us as we continue to do what thus says the Lord. We're anticipating uh, getting back into the nations. We were just talking to one of, one of my good friends in South Africa on yesterday planning and strategizing and and waiting for that appointed time that the Lord will send us back to the nations. So we need your, your support. We, we solicit your help. If you are led by God, please go to anthonyearl.org, click the donate tab, and sow your seed. If you have been blessed through these eight months and have not sown, I pray I pray that you would ask God, because just as you eat of this word, 
It is your responsibility to be a blessing back to the one who treads out the corn. There's no pressure. Be led by God. Well, don't forget this Sunday, our time of fellowship. You're invited. Join Katarina and I as we come just to hang out with you for a short time on December 20th, 4 p.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. East Coast time. Don't forget, spread the word. Daily Bible study, Monday through Saturdays, 10 a.m. Central. Join the Facebook group, Anthony Earl Ministries, Discovering Prophetic Truth and Scripture. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Invite others, share others for this time of Bible study. And until next time, thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you next time.